Today, we reference one of the greatest jump scares in the history of cinema. This completely unexpected demonic possession by Bilbo Baggins in the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, this scene works really well for a lot of reasons, mostly due to the editing, but also the surprising nature of what's going on, and it demonstrates the power of the ring and all that stuff. It's great filmmaking, we love it. But I want to focus today on the effects that enhance Ian Holmes' performance. May he rest in peace. We go from happy Bilbo to evil Bilbo. That's that's just him. That's just the acting. That's his face. But, but look at them eyes. Let's zoom in here. We are going to dive into what I would call digital makeup. Tracking individual parts of a face and then attaching effects and things like that. That is what we are going to be doing today. I've created a little scene, you know, just a little bit of a knockoff Lord of the Rings, but this is the shot right here that we are going to concentrate on. It's my attempt at acting crazy and possessed. So what we are going to do, strategy here, we are going to track the eyes and we are going to create some discolored, darkened, desaturated rings around the eyes. And then as a bonus, we're going to kind of bulge and make the mouth a bit misshapen to add to the unsettling nature of this uh, this moment here. Ooh, check out that saliva. I rendered the sequence out of Premiere and then I just isolated this piece of it and created a pre-comp. And within this pre-comp, we are going to make some magic. Okay, first things first, we want to get a good track on the eyes because that is where we're going to be making everything happen. I will open Mocha. If you're not very familiar with Mocha, I have another video all about it, but I'll try to keep things pretty uh, understandable here so you can follow along. Press and hold the Z or Z key and click and drag with the mouse to zoom. With the X key pressed, you can click and drag to move things around. That's just a little different than how most Adobe things work. So I'm analyzing the frame, I'm analyzing what's happening here, and I really like frame 256 as kind of a hero frame because the head is facing directly at the camera, which is a happy accident, and it's also not blurred. As you can see, as we scrub through the timeline, the frames surrounding it are very blurry because of the motion, but this happens to be kind of a moment in time where I was holding still or in between movements. I'm going to, to create an X spline around the area of the eye socket, kind of loose. That's about as detailed as we need it to be, and it's as simple as tracking forward and backward. Go back to that first keyframe and then track the other way. We're not really going to use much of the tracking information at the beginning of the shot, but it's in this case it's nice to just have and it doesn't hurt to, uh, to get it. It doesn't take that long. So we seem to be good to go there. I'm going to use the surface tool here with the grid to kind of check the quality of the track, make sure things are sticking the way we want, in the perspective we want, and this looks pretty good. With that looking good, this is an important step that's easy to forget. On frame 256, which we want as kind of our hero frame, we're going to send the corners of the surface to the corners of the frame. And then when you play it back, you'll see that adjustment happening with the corners, the corner pinning that will take place within After Effects. Okay, and now we will name our layer left track. I'm going to turn off the little gear here and the visibility because that's done, locked. We don't need to worry about it anymore. And let's move on to the right. Same process. We'll create a spline around the relatively flat area of the eye socket. And we just track forward and back. Go back to that keyframe, track backwards. Okay, so the surface looks pretty bad here at the beginning. Again, we don't need the information at the beginning of the shot because the effect doesn't even kick in until right about here. We'll name this right track. On frame 256, I will push the surface to the corners. And I think we are good to go. I'm going to go ahead and save that. Exit Mocha. Now let's create on frame 256 time, let's freeze frame on frame 256 and pre-compose this. I'm just going to simply name it 256, move all attributes to the new comp. And we're basically going to leave this alone. 256 is now just kind of its own thing. But within our main working comp, I'm going to duplicate it. 
Name one of them left and one of them right. So let's disable the right and concentrate on the left for the time being. Using our Mocha tracking data, let's create tracking data for the left track. Make sure that we do the corner pin that supports motion blur, because there is going to be a lot of movement. And select our left comp and apply that export. Now to see what happens, there's some corner pinning going on and that still frame is going to be flying around, which looks rather strange. If I bring the opacity down here for a second, you can kind of see what's happening is that the eye, that eye is sticking. Everything else is kind of wonky, but the eye stays in place which is what we want. So with the left comp selected, let's create a little mask. I'm going to go on frame 256 because that is our hero frame. That's where everything kind of lines up. And I'm going to click and drag and create a little mask around the areas of the eye that we want to darken. It's a little arbitrary. That mask color is awful. Let's change that. Okay, so I've created a mask. And I want to create an inner mask to subtract from that because I want to preserve the whatever movement of the eyeball exists in the video itself. I don't want the still frame of the eyeball pasted over the actual eyeball. So select subtract for that mask. Now if I solo the layer, you can see what I've created, which is a little donut around the eye. Let's just call this outer left and this other mask inner left. F for feather, and I want to feather that outer mask a good 10 to 15 pixels or so, and then the inner maybe four. There's nothing to see here. It just looks exactly the same. If I turn the layer off and on again, nothing happens because it is in fact the exact same thing from the layer below. But if we scrub a few frames ahead and I toggle the layer, you can see that we've got our little piece is moving and is, is motion blur enabled? Ah, got to enable motion blur. The, uh, the corner pinning, it has the motion blur data, but you have to enable motion blur on the layer itself for that to actually kick in. So now we can see that that has blended in quite nicely. So if we discolor or paint over this layer, we're going to see that uh, that paint is just going to track nicely with our movement. And that looks pretty good. Definitely good enough for our purposes. So how do we go about discoloring the eye, which is kind of the key here? You know, I'm not an expert digital artist for that sort of thing, but one easy way to get the quick effect would be to use blend modes in the timeline area down here. We can select the multiply blend mode. And obviously that looks, uh, well, that looks a little bit scary. Take a look at that discoloration, but it doesn't look at all like our friend Bilbo, who is in fact mostly just darkened. There isn't a lot of saturation going on here. So what I will do to fix that, just select the hue and saturation effect and drag the saturation down. And suddenly it's much more Bilbo-like black eye ring around the eye. And that is looking pretty nice. And since the effect takes place as I kind of transition to super crazy, I'm just going to create a simple opacity keyframe here. Maybe as I start to lunge is when I get to the full 100% or even less. Maybe I should just do this like 70, 80%. My second keyframe will be zero. So there's no effect, no visibility at all on that left eye until we hit this point. And then it appears and I go berserk. So let's just isolate that area. So that is kicking on pretty nicely. I am just using a simple blend mode here, but something I would like to demonstrate for those who are interested and who have a little bit more skill with Photoshop, open the content aware fill window here. And we're not going to use content aware fill as a tool per se, but I'm going to use a nice functionality within it. I'm going to use the content aware fills create reference frame tool. It will automatically launch Adobe Photoshop and it will create a Photoshop document that is saved within your After Effects file structure and that is linked into your After Effects comp. So whatever changes you make to your Photoshop document can then be dynamically linked back to After Effects. So I'm going to make a very simple change here. I'm just going to use the burn tool and just burn 
the edges of the eyes. And so if you are a digital painter and you want to go through and create all sorts of little details, this is where you would do that because Photoshop has a lot more tools than After Effects for painting. I'm trying to save this and it's giving me an error. Because this is giving me an error, I'm going to save a JPEG and then import that into my comp, which is not a workaround you should have to do, but we'll be okay. Okay, because my reference frame didn't save and doesn't have any of the special painting I did to it, I'm just going to throw that away, essentially. The Content Aware tool creates this fills folder where I can find the, uh, the PSD that was created, but because that didn't work, I'm just going to delete that. And instead, I'm going to rename the folder Paint, and let's just import that JPEG I created. Great. So now that that's in my comp, it should show up in the demon face if I turn off the multiply effect and the saturation effect. You can see that it is the altered frame from Photoshop. Your Photoshop painting is now propagated through the movement via your track. So let's repeat the process with the right eye. I'm going to create a mask on frame 256 because that's where things line up nicely for Mocha. And I already have these bags under my eyes. No makeup needed. Just a family trait. It's my favorite thing in the world. Makes me look a lot older than I am. I'm actually 13. That is a joke. And let's create the inner mask. Probably using way more points than are necessary. I don't give a crap right now. It works. Inner right, and that is a subtract mask, and I need to make sure that I've got my feather settings about where I want them, which is about 16 and 5, more or less. And let's solo that layer to make sure it looks right, and it does. So that's already working, and let's do the same thing with the multiply. Eee. The multiply blend mode, and let's go ahead and copy that hue and saturation to tone that down. And then the last, the reason it looks so much worse right now is because the opacity keyframes. The uh, left eye has that opacity animated. So we will just copy, paste. Notice that the mask on this frame does not seem to line up at all with the eye. And that is because of the corner pinning. The corner pinning does all sorts of crazy things. So the mask doesn't seem to move, but the corner pin Oh, actually, the corner pin does not move because we have not applied the tracking data just yet. Wow, that's my mistake. No worries. Go back to the base layer that has the mocha effect. Let's select our right track, uh, corner pin with motion blur, and let's select the right comp where we just did our stuff. Apply the export. And just like magic, it is now tracked. Although the mask does slip, or it appears to slip, but everything, as you can see, is tracked nicely. This is why I have a hero frame where things line up, where the, where the corners of the frame are perfectly aligned, because the corner pinning does all sorts of funny things after. Let's appreciate this lovely mess we've created. Good grief. If I go to my original layer that has no effects except for Mocha, I, if I solo that, you can see what madness we have wrought upon my visage. That's pretty much it for the eyes. I'm just going to leave it at that. Obviously, there's a lot more detail work I could do, or more painting, or maybe even more refined tracking or something, but we've already done enough for the sake of demonstration, enough tracking and detail work. I want to bulge the mouth out a little bit. I want to distort the mouth shape. Not quite like Bilbo, which has this unnatural square weird thing going on, which is very creepy and works really well. Um, but I don't, I'm not going to do exactly that. I would like to use a simple bulge to make the mouth look larger. Let's create a new null object. I'm going to call the null object mouth. Let's position that. I'm going to essentially line it up with the teeth, the middle of my teeth, and then halfway between them, right in the center of the mouth. Let's uh, animate that position manually. I'm not even bothering to use a tracker. I'm just placing the keyframes manually because it's, it's a short enough shot that 
this is going to work. And if I'm looking for the, the center point between the teeth on the tongue, there's no real feature there to track. So this is a case where a manual track, it takes like a minute or two. I want the, that bulge effect to follow the position of the center of the mouth. So we have the mouth position tracked. Now I'll add a new adjustment layer called bulge and search for the bulge effect here. And you'll see a little circle widget show up here that you can adjust the size of the area that's affected by the bulge and the bulge center. Now option or alt, click on that stopwatch for the bulge center and you open up the expression interface, which is intimidating, but we don't need to type any scripts or anything. We simply need to grab the pick whip for the bulge center, drag that to our mouth position and place that and then click out and we're good. So now the bulge you can see is positioned right where that null object is. The center of the bulge will follow the null as we go along here. So I am going to adjust that mouth shape a little bit, make it a little bit larger, and we will adjust the bulge height. And if you go really far, it starts to look like a weird internet meme. And that looks terrible. But if we keep it a bit more subtle, at like 0.5, you know, it grows, but not so, so much. Now let's try to match the keyframes of this effect up to the opacity. I'm animating the bulge height, so at this point, when the mouth is already open, right around here, we will have the bulge reach its actual value of, I have 0.9, let's just set it to 1. And if I move back a few frames to where the mouth is kind of starting to open, let's move our keyframe there and just set that value to 0. So now if we toggle the effect, nothing happens because it's at 0. So over the course of about four or five frames, the bulge takes effect and it is linked to the mouth position. So by the end here, we have a big old mouth. We could also play around with making the mouth smaller. Let's do negative 0.6. This is almost worse. Just an unnaturally small mouth. Once again, I will solo the original layers. So we have a before and after before, after. All right, let's play the full scene as I created it. My old ring. I should very much like to hold it again one last time. So now you know the basics of digital makeup. I'm going to make this After Effects file and the media that I used in it available on my Patreon if you feel like donating there. And honestly, there's probably already like a demon face Bilbo Instagram filter somewhere or Snapchat or something like that. So do I look better with dark rings around my eyes or, or nah? <laughs>